let's go ahead and jump right into this, guys. Um, so first, before we do, I think it's a good idea to recap what we did last week. I mean, last week there was a lot of good information. We learned how to effectively ask the right questions in the fact-finding section to identify our customers' needs. I'm really hoping that uh, the good majority of you are, are really working towards identifying your customers' needs in the fact find. <clears throat> it's very, very important. Uh, we learned that it's important to bring the customer's guard down in the fact finding section before attempting to uncover what their need is. In other words, you don't want to jump right into the fact find and ask them, you know, why is this important to you? That's not going to work. First, you, of course, got to bring their guard down. We also learned uh, that an enthusiastic tone in the fact find section is just as important as the questions you are asking. Without the proper tonal patterns, your questions will fall on deaf ears. So these three things are critical, fundamental things to what we need to do in order to get into our fact find and identify our customer's need. We learned that it's important to praise our customers all throughout the fact-finding section in an effort to make them feel good, right? When somebody's feeling good, they're going to talk with you. If you give somebody a compliment with an enthusiastic tone, most likely they're going to talk to you. If you smile and you relax and you, you, you give them an enthusiastic hello, most likely they're going to come back with an enthusiastic hello. So you got to praise and you got to get your customer feeling good. We learned that the way to engage somebody in a meaningful exchange is by using the three-in-one rapport building method where you ask the, the, the customer three questions in sequence and then you relate back to them with something uh, about yourself in relationship to the way they answered those questions using vivid details. That's key. When you use vivid details, you're able to paint a picture in your customer's mind, which then in turn will allow them to share in more detail with you. And lastly, we learned how to transition from the fact finding section to the health section of the script. We learned that it's important to praise the customer up, make them feel good for the information that they shared with you. We then learned to create some doubt by letting them know that we don't know enough about their health yet if, and, and if they're gonna get approved. And then we assumed the sale and said, but if we are able to get you approved, I know we're gonna make sure we get this in place for you today and so we assumed the sale so we did those three things in the transition from the fact find to the health section now that we've got the fact find down and we're working towards implementing all of this training here now it's time to start talking about the other side of what we need to be doing in the fact find so this week we're going to take a deeper dive and learn how to identify the customer's most likely objections or concerns based on the facts that we learn about our customers in the fact-finding section. So again, we're going to learn how to identify what the most likely objections or concerns are going to be based on the facts that we gather in the fact-finding section. We're going to learn how to address and nullify those objections or concerns before the customer brings them up as an excuse not to do business today. Some of you probably know where I'm going with this. This is called response block selling. Response block selling. 
It's a method for preempting a buyer's objection or concern before he or she can verbalize it aloud. Okay, so think about that a little bit. It's a method for preempting a buyer's objection or objections or concerns before they can even verbalize them aloud. So the key here is to prevent the buyers from voicing an objection, thereby shunting the need to then support that objection. When somebody makes an objection, well, now they have to back it up. Now they have to support their objection. Now they have to start looking for things that support their objections. And we don't want that to happen. If you can address the buyer's concerns before the buyer either brings it up or they're even aware of it, you stand a much better chance of being able to control how the objection is handled and when the objection is handled. So what to look for in the fact find, okay? This is the other side. So we're asking them all these questions. We're gathering information from this customer and we want to know if this customer is married. Why do we want to know if this customer is married? Because potentially there could be a spousal objection, correct? So we need to find that information out. We need to find out if our customers live with their children or talk about how their children are always around, okay? How old are their children? Do they live with their children? Are they around their children a lot? Do their children help them do a lot of things? Because if that's the case, then chances are we may get a concern about they need to talk this over with their children or their, um, their wife or, or husband. We need to find out if the customer is really close to their brothers, sisters, or friends, or family? Is there somebody that's close to them that does things for them? We need to find out, does the customer talk about money being tight? Are they on a fixed income? Are they talking about affordability in the fact finding up front in the process? Right? We need to find this information out because chances are there may be some concerns or some objections around this stuff later on down the road, and we need to figure out a way to block those objections from ever even coming up or being voiced. Uh, we need to find out if the customer is talking about already having some coverage in place right? What can come up at the end? Well, I already have coverage in place. I think I have enough. We need to find out what it is that they got going on with their current coverage. We need to find out if this customer is currently employed, if they're disabled, if they're on Social Security, and we, we want to try to organically bring this information out of the customer in the fact-finding section. We need to find out how long they've been thinking about it for. How long has this customer been looking around for coverage? We need to find this out organically. Sometimes you can't just come right out and ask that question. That's why asking the right questions with the right tonality is so, so important here. We need to find out, has the customer mentioned that they've been looking around for coverage? Have they been shopping around, right? Because what's one of the objections that we get in the end? Well, I'm shopping around right now, right? I'm, I'm, I'm looking around, okay? I'm still calling around. We want to find out if the customer's doing that up front in the process so that we can 
overcome that objection or block that objection with response block selling. We want to find out if they talk about another person helping them a lot with things like their bills or doctor's appointments and such. Do they have a payee? Is there somebody who comes over and helps them with their medications? Do they have a trusted advisor, somebody that they run everything by? We need to find out about these things up front because they can become a potential objection or concern later on down the road. And we also want to pay attention to the way that the customer is answering our questions. Do they seem sharp? Do they seem like they're with it? Do they seem like a decision maker? We have to pay attention to all of these things in the fact find, and we need to uncover these things so that we can start working towards blocking any potential objections around a person saying they want to think about it and talk to somebody else, affordability, uh, spousal objection, um, money's objections, all kinds of objections. We need to start finding those things out up front in the process. Are y'all with me so far? Thank you for responding, Linda and Sean and Kelly. I appreciate that. Um, good stuff. So this is the other side or the unspoken side of the fact find. Okay, this is the unspoken spoken side of the fact find. The spoken side is asking the questions, using the proper tonality, bringing your customer's guard down through your word tracks, you know, through the way you're praising them. That's the spoken side. The unspoken side is all of these things. It's looking for these things, being aware of what's going on. What is your customer saying? How are they reacting to you when you assume the sale on them? Are they saying things like, well, I, I may need to talk this over with my, my husband? Or are they saying things like, well, it just depends on how much it costs because money is tight. Are they saying things like, well, I'm looking around for coverage right now. I've been looking around and I've talked to two other companies. Are they saying these things? And if so, what are we going to do about it? Because if we don't address them now, if we don't address them throughout the process, I shouldn't say now, but as we move through the process, well then you can almost bet your bottom dollar that they're going to come up at the end when you go and ask for the money. So once you identify a potential concern or an objection that could arise, Raising and addressing any potential concern prior to the buyer bringing it up will help you to establish credibility in the buyer's eyes by demonstrating a firm understanding of the buyer's concerns. Okay? What this does is when you raise the, the concern or when you bring the objection up, it establishes credibility and it lets the customer know that you know what they're going through, that you know what they're thinking about, that you know what they're concerned about. Okay, that's important. That's part of you being that authoritative expert, that professional, that listening professional. By doing this, you're also going to gain trust by being forthright. Okay, your customer is going to feel good about who you are as a person because they're like, hey, this person understands me. They're bringing up the things that I'm concerned about. I trust this person. They're being very forthright. And lastly, it allows you to take control of the objection. In other words, be on the offense. You're in control and be in a position to address the matter in a manner that's more favorable to you. Okay? When you bring up a potential objection and you know exactly what you're going to say, you're in control and you can address it in a much more favorable way 
than you can when in a customer all of a sudden springs an objection upon you and now you're on the defense and you're trying to overcome that objection. You're on the defense. You weren't expecting it. You didn't know it was coming and now you're really, you're trying to figure out what to do, what to say, and you're not in control. So these are what is good. This is what's going to happen when you raise the objection with your customer. So let's talk about the, the response block structure, what this actually looks like. But before I actually do that, let's talk about two cognitive concepts, rules, that are the premise of why response block selling works. Okay, let's talk about these things. Number one is the rule of consistency. The rule of consistency states people behave in accordance to their beliefs in order to reduce mental discomfort. Okay, that's something you're going to have to remember for later on in this training. Okay, just remember that people are going to behave in accordance to their beliefs in order to reduce mental discomfort. When you start making somebody try to believe something that they don't believe, it's uncomfortable. Okay, they have to think, they have to sweat a little, they have to really, you know, try to understand what you're saying, and it's not easy sometimes. Okay, so just understand that that's just a basic rule that people are going to behave in accordance with their beliefs in order to reduce mental discomfort. So if they believe that they need to talk to their husband or their wife, then that's what they believe, and that's the way they're going to roll, okay? It's just the way it is. So our goal is to answer buyers' potential concerns or objections before they are publicly stated aloud so that we may overcome these concerns or objections with more ease under our own control and timing. Because if a customer states an objection to you or verbalizes an objection to you, then they're going to look for things that support that objection to ease their mental discomfort, okay? So if we can bring up the objection prior to them bringing it up under our own control, then we can make this easier for them. Because once they verbalize it, now they're looking for ways to validate their objection, okay, to ease their mental discomfort. So we want to make sure that we bring up the objection prior to them ever bringing it up so that we can ease that mental discomfort. I hope that makes sense. The second rule is the rule of selective perception. Once people make a public statement, they're going to seek out information, basically what I was just talking about. They're going to selectively try to reinforce their views while filtering out anything that may challenge or contradict their views. That's why it's difficult to overcome concerns in the end by saying things like, well, you told me this or you told me that, you know. It's difficult to overcome a concern or an objection when somebody's already verbalized it because they believe that and they don't want to go through the mental discomfort of trying to learn something different. Okay? So that's why being agreeable when somebody objects to you is so important because if you go against the grain, well, now you're flirting with this selective perception rule. They're gonna be against you. They're not gonna to wanna to go that way because there's mental discomfort. There's mental discomfort thinking of anything other than what they just said to you. If an objection is voiced or left unchecked by the buyer or by you, the buyers may seek information to confirm their beliefs and therefore not go forward with a buying decision. Okay, so 
understand these two rules. This is the basic premise of why response block structure works. Response block selling works. You have to understand these two things about the human brain. Okay. Once you understand it, you can start to grasp what you're going to do with response block selling. The, the, the thing about this is think, think about yourself. When you, make a statement and you're uh, debating something with somebody, right? And you make a statement, what do you do? You make a statement. Well, no, it works like this. I believe it works like this because of this, 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 and this. You start looking for all of these things to reinforce your view, okay? Once that process starts, it's hard to reverse it. That's again why we need to bring up the objection or raise the concern prior to them raising the concern under our own control. So again, the goal here with response block selling is twofold. We're gonna answer buyer's concerns before they're made public. And in doing so, we're gonna prevent them from selecting reasons for why they shouldn't buy i.e. we're gonna take away any excuses or justification, real or imagined in their brain. When you raise an objection, that leaves you in full control on how to best handle or discard the objection before the buyer voices it or maybe even thinks of it. The buyer may not even be thinking of these objections, you just may be hearing them say things about their husband or their wife, they may not be thinking that they need to talk to them, okay? But you know from, from experience that the good majority of people that you talk to that are married are gonna tell you that they need to talk with their husband or their wife, okay? So we need to bring this stuff up prior to it ever being voiced. So the first step is we're gonna look for and we're gonna list all possible concerns or objections that your customers may have based on their current situation, okay? This is why an effective fact-finding section is important. Without a proper fact-finding section, you will not be able to identify all of the potential objections or concerns that may exist, okay? This is why when you get to this section, you can't spend one minute there. You have to spend eight to 15 minutes fact-finding, building rapport, doing the three-in-one method, asking the right questions, using the proper tonality. Without this, you can't do this side of the business. You're not gonna have the information that you need in order to block all of the potential objections that may exist based on their current circumstances. So we've already talked about this a little bit. We wanna look for if the customer's married, we wanna know if they have children, we wanna know if they're close to their brothers and sisters, their family, friends. We wanna know if they talk about money, if money's tight, their fixed income, affordability. Does the customer already have coverage? Is the customer employed, disabled, on social security? Uh, how long have they been thinking about this for? Has the customer mentioned this before about looking around for coverage or shopping around? Do they talk about another person helping them? Um, does the customer seem to be sharp? We talked about all those things. You have to figure those things out. And then the step two is you have to take each potential objection and create an acknowledgement statement or what I call a response block so that you can raise that objection yourself, okay? Now today we're not gonna actually go into these acknowledgement statements. Tomorrow I'm gonna introduce some new ones. I've already introduced some a couple months ago. I'm gonna introduce some new acknowledgement statements based around all of these things here that I'm talking about. Okay, so if the customer's married, what are we gonna say to block the spousal objection? How are we gonna do that? Okay, we're gonna raise the objection 
so that you can control the direction of the conversation. Did I skip a step here? One second here. Oh no, 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 we're good. All right, step three. We're gonna create an offer to resolve that potential objection for the client, okay? So if the client is concerned or if you feel that the client may have a concern about needing to speak with their spouse or their husband or their children, we're gonna create an offer up front in the process to resolve that objection for the client. What we're looking for here is to make the client agree to a deal, so to speak. So, for instance, if the customer has a, a husband, we're going to make sure that the, 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 the wife understands that, hey, if we can get you approved, we're going to make sure that you receive this package, that you get the policy in the mail, so that you can go over all of this with your husband. Okay, We're going we're gonna to make an offer to resolve the potential objection that may come up down the road about needing to talk to their husband or their wife. And step four is we're going to demonstrate how this final expense policy and your service, you, will overcome the customer's concern or objection that we raised in step two. Remember, we're raising this objection. They're not raising it. We're raising it. And we're going to show or demonstrate how this policy in our service is going to overcome any potential concern or objection. In step five, we're going to tie down the prospect to an agreement that the objection or the concern was resolved. Okay, so we're going to get it resolved. So if their concern is about affordability, uh, we're going to make sure that we get that resolved prior to ever quoting them any rates. This is the opportunity to get the buyer to agree that the objection you raised was indeed put to bed in the buyer's eyes. The goal here is to get an agreement so that later on in the presentation, the buyer doesn't use it as an excuse not to move forward. This agreement should be in line with the agreement you asked for in step three. All you want to do here is get confirmation. So you're going to try to get two confirmations. You're going to get one in step three, and then you're really going to drive it home in step five and put it to bed so that later on down the road, after you ask for the money, they're not bringing this type of stuff up anymore. In both step three and five, you will be inserting an agreement. I just said this, I jumped ahead of myself. Each agreement is aimed at getting the buyer to agree that the objection made in step two, okay, the objection that you raised in step two has been addressed and it's been resolved. This tactic is crucial in getting the client to make small commitments leading up to the ultimate, ultimate commitment for when you ask for the money. When the buyer agrees to step three and acknowledges the agreement in step five, the buyer, according to the rule of consistency, will behave accordingly, okay? They've already agreed to that, okay? They've already made up in their mind that they've agreed two times, step three and step five, they agree, that that objection has been put to bed, okay? So because of that, they're gonna behave in the end with consistency. That's where this rule of consistency comes into play. In other words, if you address the objection in step three and have it resolved and have the uh, objection resolved, then you'll need to get the buyer to acknowledge the very same thing in step five, and then when you ask for the money, there should be no, no, no different behaviors here. They've already agreed. Everything is good to go. Uh, some of the common objections we face, right? I can't afford it right now. I have to talk to my kids. I don't make fast decisions. 
I can get it cheaper elsewhere. I'm shopping around, right? We need to make sure, again, we need to make sure that we're identifying those potential objections or concerns up front in that fact-finding section so that we don't get bamboozled later on down the road after we say, tell me, which option do you want to leave to your wife? Boom, boom, boom. Well, I need to talk to my kids about this. Well, I don't make decisions fast. Send it out to me in the mail. We don't want to be reeling at this point trying to overcome those objections. We should have already covered those objections and blocked those objections way, way, way before. So tomorrow, we will show you response block structures, okay? For each of the listed concerns and objections, I'm gonna try to get through as many as I can, and then I'm gonna provide you with the word tracks again so that you can have these word tracks and try to overcome or block these objections before they're ever even voiced by the customer. I'm going to give you the exact word tracks to block these objections. And uh, I think this is going to be really helpful, but you have to put this into play and you have to be doing a proper fact find. Without a proper fact find, you cannot do response block selling. It won't happen because you won't know what their concerns are. You'll be assuming them. And assuming is not a good, uh, a good way to go. When you're when you're shooting for success so I know we're wrapping up a little bit early and that's okay but I want to know are there any questions do you guys have any questions here No questions? Okay, so I know today was just an outline of the steps and, and just getting a basic understanding of what I'm even talking about. Please don't miss tomorrow's training because tomorrow we're gonna get into the meat and potatoes of how you actually do this in our process. How do you actually block somebody from saying, that they, they want to talk to their husband or wife? How do you actually block somebody from saying that they can't afford it? How do you block somebody from saying they need to shop around? How do you block somebody from saying they need to talk to their kids before they make a decision? How do you do those things? Tomorrow I'm going to give you the exact word tracks. I'm going to show you uh, different areas throughout the process where you can insert this type of response block selling. And so today's training without tomorrow's training is useless. So please join me for tomorrow's training and uh, I will be sure to go over all of this information with you and give you the tools that you need to start response block selling. Have a great day guys. I hope that was important.